Hi, this is Scott Morrison. Welcome to the Foothills Calvary YouTube channel. We're a church located in Lakewood, Colorado as part of the Calvary Chapel movement. Our goal is to provide an opportunity for you to hear the whole word of God preached chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Make sure you hit the subscribe button and follow along as we read God's word together. We hope you find this channel encouraging and that God speaks to you through his word and through the Holy Spirit. So this morning uh, we are doing a little bit of a of a one off, and I've been I've been kind of pressuring Scott to we need to preach out of the Old Testament, um, and that's just because I like preaching out of the Old Testament. And so when he gave me a Sunday in between Philippians and James, um, I decided I'm gonna I'm gonna do that. So I'm gonna be preaching out of out of Psalm 19 this morning, um, and so I'm still gonna I'm still gonna pray briefly before we. We continue, and then and then we'll dive in. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning, um, and I pray um, as we as we study your Word that we would uh, learn more about who you are, uh, about what you want for our lives, and we would be reminded um, of what you've what you've done, what you do for us today, and and what you're going to do in the future. Um, and we look forward to that day when you return and you gather your people um, to yourself, and we get to spend eternity with you. In your name, we pray. Amen. So Psalm 19, um, many of you might be familiar. In fact, I picked many of the songs uh, that, we, that we sang today uh, with this psalm in mind, uh, which, which actually ended up working out really well. Uh, but Psalm 19, and many people might be familiar with especially the first six verses of this psalm. And we might remember, um, we might even have the first um, few verses memorized um, without even hardly trying. Uh, the heavens are telling the glory of God and the expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Um, I think we, we know about that. And so a lot of times when we look at this psalm, um, it, we think of it as, as a psalm about creation only, um, a psalm about uh, creation and, and how it, how it worship is, worships and praises God and points to him. Um, but, but what I'm going to describe this morning is a little bit different of a focus on this psalm, um, and a focus is where, where I think it should be. is not just on creation, but I think there's more to it. Uh, I think this, this, this um, psalm is about worship, and it's about revelation, and, and I think it's especially about, um, especially about God's word. Imagine that, a worship leader preaching about worship. That's new. <laughs> And after reading this first section in chapter 19, I, I couldn't help but think of, of similar experiences that I've had um, in nature, in the outdoors, uh, and, and how that, um, I mean, if you, if you've been, if you spent, if you like spending time outdoors and if you've been outdoors and if you have, you've observed something really beautiful, um, especially in, you know, in Colorado when we have access to so much here, um, you all know what I'm talking about when you can, you can kind of, like, you know that. You see, you see what God has done. You know that he's done this. You know that, that everything that we see, all the beauty that we see in creation isn't just by accident. We know that God created this. Um, and, and so I couldn't help but think of, of situations like that where I've been in the outdoors and I've felt an overwhelming, um, an overwhelming desire just to worship him for what he's done, uh, to worship him for what he's created, uh, to worship, worship him for his handiwork. Um, because we know that when we see all of this, we know that it's pointing to God. And I think you've all probably done the same thing that I've done, which is I try to do this less and less and less, but uh, where you take pictures and then, and then you try to share it with somebody, or you take a video of, of a waterfall, or you take a picture of a sunrise, and you try to share it with somebody, but it just doesn't, you don't see that light in their eyes that you felt like you had when you were observing it live. And the, the pictures and the videos just don't seem to do it justice. And I think the reason for that is because part of the experience that makes the outdoors so exhilarating and refreshing is that it's creation pointing to a creator. It's not just, it's not just something that exists. It's actually pointing to something even bigger than that. And that's why this psalm is so powerful, because it describes in detail in those first six verses God's creation pointing to his glory and to his wonder and to his might. And so this psalm, Psalm 19, is, is basically broken into, into three um, stanzas, I guess you could say, um, since it's, since it's in, written in poetry and not prose. Uh, the first stanza is about creation, the second is about scripture, and the third is about our response. 
And so we're going to go over that in a little bit more detail. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to going through this because we've been primarily going through letters, right? We went through, um, we went through First and Second Peter, and then we went through Revelation. Uh, we've been going through Philippians. I might be missing something in there, but I think that's, that's the order. So we've been going through letters, um, which are written directly to the church. Um, and now we get to read something that's altogether a different type of literature. And so I'm really looking forward to diving into this and, and seeing what God has to say through his word this morning. Um, whenever I stand up here, I always think about, I can't remember what pastor that said it, but he says, I never feel the de- fear the devil when I'm standing in the pulpit, but I fear the law of the Lord. And it's such a, it's such a humble place to be. And as I was studying this, I couldn't help but think how humbled we can be or how humbled we should be when we observe what God has done through his creation and through how he guides us and answers our prayers every single day. So I'll read verse one and two, and then we'll start uh, working our way through this. So Psalm 19, verses 1, says, The heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. C.S. Lewis describes Psalm 19 as one of the greatest poems, not just in the Bible, but one of the greatest poems in all of literature. He says that the, the sweep is magnificent because it talks about the, the heavens and the stars declaring the, the work of God all the way to the soul of the believer. Um, and it's pretty phenomenal. He has so much to say, which I'll get into. C.S. Lewis has so much to say about this psalm and what it says for our daily lives and what we can learn from it. And it's so powerful. It's so well written. Um, the transitions, the, the words that he uses. And, and sometimes I wish, I wish we could all, because I, I, I don't know Hebrew. I can't read Hebrew. But sometimes I kind of wish that I could so I could really experience um, what, what it was written in its original language um, because the, 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 the rhyme schemes and the way it was put together must have just been fantastic. But what's really neat is because this is the inspired word of God, we don't miss out on anything no matter what language we read it in, right? <clears throat> and David, who wrote this psalm probably, um, says a psalm of David right here, so I'm gonna assume that he's the one who wrote it unless someone gives me a reason to believe otherwise. But David was especially familiar with the vast expanse of the stars. I mean, he was, he was a, a former shepherd, and so basically he was a professional outdoorsman, and I would think that he probably uh, continued to spend time outdoors as much as possible even he, when he was king of Israel. But he was especially familiar with this, and I'm sure he spent many lonely nights staring at the stars in wonderment and awe of God's glory. And there's an important realization that comes with this, more important than just looking at creation and and enjoying it, because the goal isn't just to spend time in creation and enjoy it. The goal is to pay attention to what it points to. And the realization is this, as vast and awesome as the skies are, as as magnificent as the mountains are, as as awe-inspiring and powerful as, um, as, as mighty rivers are, they're merely the handiwork of God. Verse two says, their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. And so everything that we see in creation, no matter how powerful it is, how vast the ocean is, how large the sky is and how many stars, all of these things that we see and we wonder at and we're still, as human beings, we're still studying this and we haven't figured everything out yet. We continue to study God's creation and as Christians, we re- as followers of God, we realize that all of this vastness and magnificent wonder that we see in creation is just the work of his fingers. It's just the work of his hands. And they pale in comparison to him. But this creation points to him. And so when we look at this and we realize how wonderful and amazing it is, it's so much, it points to something so much bigger. Many years after David, a Palestinian Jew wrote a similar poem in, um, in, a, in a book that we, many of you might, might have heard of that's in, in what's called the Apocrypha. Um, there's, there's a bunch of writings that came many years after most of the scriptures were written um, that some, some um, well, I guess the Catholic Church still includes many of these, but um, this Palestinian Jew wrote in the book of, of Sirach, he wrote, great is the Lord who made it, and praise due is, is due his name. And he observed something similar to what David observed. He, he looked at uh, creation, he looked at the wonder and the vastness and the awesomeness, and he didn't praise the creation and say, man, how amazing is this? He said, how great is the Lord who made all of this. In verse two, it says, day to day pours forth speech and night to night reveals knowledge. As I read this verse, it was a little bit, I don't know, maybe it's just the translation I was reading, but I, I, I read through it many times and was just having a tough time understanding 
uh, what's happening here, but then I read a commentary, again, by C.S. Lewis that was very helpful, um, and he explained it in this way. He said, basically, the goodness of one day and the goodness of one night overflows to the next because it's almost as if one day can't contain all the fullness of God's glory. And so it keeps overflowing and it keeps bubbling over into the next day. And what that tells us is that you can't spend enough time in God's creation to fully understand his glory. No matter how much time you spend in the mountains, no matter how much time you spend in in creation that's awe-inspiring, no matter how many sunsets you see, as amazing as they are, we're not gonna fully understand God's glory through that. Just as we as humans, through science and through biology and through whatever else, we study creation and we study it um, and try to understand, we're not even close to fully understanding everything. I don't remember what the statistic is, and this just popped into my head now, but um, you'd be amazed if you look it up how little of the ocean has actually gone unexplored. There's not a whole lot we can do in creation to fully understand his glory. No matter how, we don't have enough time to observe creation and fully understand God's wonder until we stand in his presence because it merely points to him. It's merely just a, a fingerprint God's creation presents a very specific revelation of his might and his glory. The beauty of God's creation, again, is not meant to inspire us to worship creation, which is a mistake that that many Christians have made throughout the years and Paul talks about in the first chapter of Romans. But the beauty of God's creation is meant to point us to the worship of the beauty of God, realizing that creation and all its wonder and beauty, it's only just his handiwork. It's only just the work of his fingers. And it only just points to him and his power and his might and his glory. Verse three says, there's no speech nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. It says their line or their their sound has gone out through all the earth and their utterances to the end of the world. There's no verbal communication coming from creation or the stars or the sun, at least not, I mean, the Creation makes sound, but <laughs> there's, not, there's not words coming out of it. There's not verbal communication that is, um, that is saying things about who God is. And that's okay, which I'll explain here in a minute. It's entirely nonverbal, but of course, I think everyone in here has probably been in a conversation where somebody is saying one thing, but their body language is portraying another. And so then you realize how important nonverbal communication is. But nonverbal communication by itself doesn't accomplish much, Right? By itself, it, does, it only accomplishes very little, but it's such a massive part of all of the other pieces intertwined. And so when you're having a conversation with somebody or when you're um, listening to somebody or when I'm preaching and somebody's got their arms crossed, nobody had their arms crossed, that would have been really awkward. <laughs> or else they would have been like... <laughs> There's nonverbal communication that goes with that. And so nonverbal communication is important, but it doesn't communicate everything. We'd be foolish to think that it's not important. Verse four says their utterances go out through all the earth, so the sound and the, so the nonverbal communication that, that creation is making is saying something. It is saying something about God and about his glory, about his might, about his wisdom. But it can be misunderstood and it doesn't say everything that there is to say. I don't think creation can. Now then the end of verse four and through six It says this, it says, in them, so in creation, in creation he has placed a tent for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. It rejoices as a strong man to run his course. Its rising is from one end of the heavens and its circuit to the other end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. Um, I don't know if you can tell or not, but I'm actually a lot redder than I, than I, than I look right now because I was in the sun um, for a large portion of yesterday. Did you know above tree line, there's no shade <laughs> in the mountains? <laughs> you can't really escape from it um, at all. And so uh, I, thought about, I thought about that a lot um, yesterday as I was, I was prepping the sermon. I was um, driving in the mountains a little bit. And I was thinking about this idea and how um, you can't, there's certain places where you can't really hide, hide from the sun. And, and I'm, I'm sure the reason that David used this is because the desert is probably very, um, very, very similar um, to that. I, I don't, has anybody in here been to Israel? Okay, there's a few. So you know how, how um, little shade there is on some roads and how um, scorching the sun can be and how hot it can be. And I'm sure David was thinking of that 
um, when, when he wrote this, um, this passage. But he says, much, basically, much like the stars in the heavens, much like the rest of creation, um, the sun declares his glory and might and his power. The sun says something about God as well. As robust as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and as robust as an athlete ready to run a race, he will surely win. So is the sun in its virility and power. It covers the whole earth and nothing is hidden from its gaze. And this would have definitely resonated with, with readers in, in, um, in the early centuries in Palestine that would have been dealing with this hot sun and the lack of shade all the time. Now, it's common to look at these verses and to read especially these first six verses. Like I said, almost everybody's familiar with the first part of this psalm, but the rest of the psalm is a little bit less familiar. In fact, many scholars disconnect the, the, the sections. They say, oh, Psalm 19, 1 through 6 is talking about one thing, and then 7 through 14 is talking about something entirely different. And it's common to look at these verses in 1 through 6 as, as, as only natural revelation, and natural revelation essentially is, is the revelation that, that what, what God reveals to us through his creation. That's what natural revelation, revelation is. And in some sense, it is that, but it's not only that, because natural revelation has its limitations. And, it doesn't, and natural revelation doesn't adequately describe who God is in all of his glory, all of his wisdom, and all of his might. It definitely says something about him, and it points to him, but it can be miscommunicated. It can be misunderstood. First of all, it's, it's nonverbal, which we talked about already, and because it's nonverbal, it can only say so much, and it can't be by itself. Nonverbal communication is limited. And second, natural revelation or God's creation points to his might and glory, but it points to his essential deity, but creation doesn't say anything about God's love, about his character, and about his grace and his mercy. It, I had to think about that for a minute because when I, when I first read that in one of the commentaries I had gone through and as I was, I was praying about it, I thought, what does creation say? Because it doesn't say everything, does it? We can't observe creation, observe creation and understand, understand salvation. We can't observe creation and understand everything God has spoken to us and everything we understand through the promptings of his Holy Spirit. And furthermore, natural revelation can be vastly misunderstood you can't just observe creation and learn the fullness of God's truth. I've heard many people make comments, and they, they'll say things like, oh, if I want to commune with God, I just, I just go into the outdoors. I just go into the mountains. Or, the, or they'll say, oh, I don't go to church. I, I don't read my Bible. I just, the outdoors is my church. That's where I feel closest to God. And then they kind of stop at that. And while there's a very, very slight bit of truth to what they're saying, because when you're in creation, obviously what God has made, his handiwork is pointing to him. But there's something else that needs to be said. There's more that we can learn from God. In Romans chapter 1, verses 20 through 22, I'll turn, turn there real, real quick. I don't know that I put that in the slides, so I apologize if it's not there, Jason. But in Romans chapter 1, verses 20 through 22, Paul says, For since the creation of this world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what he has made so that they are without excuse. So in other words, how can you observe God's handiwork and not acknowledge him as creator? And in verse 21, it says, For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. But they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. So in other words, creation makes it very obvious, which by the way, Romans chapter one, verses 20 through I think 24 is kind of Paul's commentary on Psalm 19. And so we read, we read chapter one, verses 20 through 22, and we realize that, that Paul saw this same problem in the first century church, as he saw people observing creation and thinking that they could learn everything there is to know about God through creation. But the problem is, they didn't learn everything there is to know about him. They acknowledged him as God, as creator slightly, but they didn't fully understand who he was and what he has done. So thinking that they had become wise, they became foolish. 
And we see this today in a whole number of different ways. When people, people worship creation and they, they think they, they fully understand God, they worship creation and they think they're wise because they understand what God has made, but they become fools because they do not understand the fullness of who God is and what he's done and what he's gonna do in the future. The danger becomes then when people worship nature and that becomes a God rather than something merely pointing to God. And that's where the rest of this psalm comes in. That's where scripture comes in. So let's read verses seven through 10 together. It says, the law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. So it kind of seems like there's an abrupt transition between verse six and verse seven, doesn't, doesn't it? Which is why probably many scholars look at the rest of Psalm 19 as kind of something different altogether. But I think when Paul wrote chapter one, verses 20 in the book, in the letter to the Roman church, he understood the connection here and he understood why this was important. So though it seems like uh, there's this kind of abrupt change from one, one subject to the other, they're actually intricately linked. And it ties back to this idea about the sun. So when it says, um, in, at the end of verse six, it says, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. And then he goes right into the law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. And it starts to talk about the word of God. It starts to talk about his scripture and the importance of how he's spoken to us. C.S. Lewis describes it this way. He says, the law in verse seven hardly seems to the psalmist or to David. The law in verse seven hardly seems to the psalmist something else because it is so like the all-piercing, all-detecting sunshine. I had to read that again a few times to fully understand what he was saying. If you've read C.S. Lewis ever, sometimes his, his sentences can be can be very long and undulating from touching on different subjects as they go through, kind of like the way Paul writes. But his point is that in the same way that, the, that David thought about the sun and how, it, and, and how it's, all cons- it's an all-consuming force in the desert, how it, it seeks out every corner of shade and you can't hide from it. In the same way, the law of our Lord seeks out every corner of our hearts and every corner of our souls where we try to hide our innermost thoughts from him. And so the tr- point of that transition is this. Creation can't say everything that there is to know about God. So we need God's word as well. We can't just discern everything from being in creation. You see, God is revealed more fully through his law and through his scripture. As much as God reveals himself in nature, he reveals himself in more fullness in his word. Now in verses seven through nine, we see some attributes of scripture and it's really interesting the way that it's broken down. So it's broken down into these statements that are the first half of each verse is something scripture is and then the second half of each verse is something scripture does. So I'll read it again and think about it in these terms. So seven through nine, the first line is gonna be, um, is gonna be what scripture is and then the second part is gonna be what scripture does. And I would encourage you as I read through this again, Think of it as I'm reading poetry to you because, well, I am. But think about how, how this communicates who God is and what he's done to each and every one of, for each and every one of us. It says, the law of the Lord is perfect. And something scripture is. Restoring the soul. Something scripture does. The testimony of the Lord is sure. And it makes wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, and it endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true, and they are righteous altogether. It was really interesting to study it in this way and to see it broken up. And man, you can really dive deep. Um, there's some, like when I, when I get a commentary to read, I'm not like Nori. I don't have like this, I, if, his library is in, 
insane. I don't get commentaries that are this thick. I get commentaries that are like this thick. So it's really simple and easy for me to understand. Um, and this is so one of the commentaries that my dad recommended, he was like, oh, here's one on Psalms you'll like. It was this big, thick thing, and I started to read, and man, he dove deep into these verses in the seven through nine, how you can break up these attributes and put them in different groups as to how they relate and how they don't and, and what, what they point to. And I was like, no, nope, that's too much. And so I'm just gonna keep it really simple, as simple as I can. <laughs> So I'll say this, the point of all of this, of all of these different, which we believe, right? We believe that the law of the Lord is perfect. We believe that it's sure, it's right, it's clean, it's pure. It restores us and enlightens us and it gives us wisdom. The point of saying all that isn't to give us an excuse to dive in um, to each and everything and try to break them up and fit them together into different groups, but it's to say this, as magnificent as, magnificent as the heavens are and as vast as the ocean is, as awesome as the mountains are, they don't hold a candle to how God reveals himself in his word. And so as amazing as creation is, and when you, and when you, you take, take pictures because you want to remember what you're experiencing, when, when, you're, when you're in the outdoors and you're um, like, whatever, whatever you like to do outside, doesn't really matter, whatever you're doing and you observe creation and you want to praise God for what he's made, remember that, he reveals himself in such a more powerful way through his word. As amazing as the mountains are, as amazing as the ocean is, as amazing as his creation is, his, his word is even more incredible. And it says even more about who he is and what he's done. Jesus himself acknowledges this in John chapter 17, verse 17. On the second half of the verse, he says, your word is truth. That everything we see in front of us that God has made, even though he was the one that made it, his handiwork doesn't hold a candle to how he revealed himself through his word and through his son. So the first half of each verse reminds us of what his word is, what his law is, what his testimony is. And the second half reminds us what scripture does for us. It reminds us that because of who God is and what his word is, that it still affects our lives today. And we can have hope through that, amen? Amen. We can have hope when we read his word because all of these promises that he's made are not just to the people that were initially the readers of these, but all these promises, when you read throughout the Old Testament and all of these promises that he made to Israel, we get to be included in that, don't we? Because of what Jesus did on the cross, we get to be included as God's people. We can have hope when we read his word, knowing that he's revealed himself as true, as perfect, as sure, as right, as clean, as righteous. And so then we read verse 10, and this is how we should feel about the word. There is nothing else on this earth that we should desire as much as this book right here. There is nothing on earth that's as, as, as sweet, as important, as, as, as full as, of riches. There's nothing on earth that holds a candle to God's word. And so verse 10 says, that they, so God's words, are more desirable than, than gold. Yes, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. And so when we hold this book in our hand, when we read and study his word, we should be as excited to read this book and to study what God has spoken to us through his scriptures than we should be to be in the outdoors and observing his creation because there's so much more in here, isn't there? So the first movement of the psalm was revelation about God through nature. The second stanza of the psalm was how God revealed himself through his word. And now we're gonna go to this section about our response and how we're supposed to react to this. So because it is more desirable than gold, because it is sweeter than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb, verse 11 says, moreover by them your servant is warned. By God's word we are warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. I think we know that anytime we read the Old Testament is there's a lot of warnings in the Old Testament. <laughs> But in keeping God's word is there is great reward. 
And the reward, of course, isn't here on earth. The reward, of course, isn't some prosperity gospel idea where the, the stronger our faith is, the more he's gonna bless us financially or materialistic, materialistically. But the reward, I think we all know, is in heaven, in his presence, worshiping him forevermore. And verse 12 says this, it says, who can discern his errors? Acquit me of hidden faults. Anybody in here can discern your own errors before God? You couldn't before his word. This is a rhetorical question. Rhetorical question means that David is not really expecting an answer. He's making a point. Who can discern his errors? And who can acquit me of hidden faults? Well, we can't do that. That's the whole point of hidden faults. Only God knows the innermost thoughts in our heart. Only he knows what's in our soul. Only he can discern our deepest errors and only he can acquit us of our hidden faults. That's the point. He says also in verse 13, keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not rule over me. Then I will be blameless and I shall be acquitted of great transgression. And verse 14 says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. I couldn't help think about when I read verse 14, how this points to back to God's revelation through creation. Now, if you remember everything creation does, whether we like it or not, like it's too hot outside, well, it's too bad. <laughs> Everything that creation does points perfectly to God and his might and his glory. And now the hope would be for us. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Sounds just like my son, my son does the same thing. Daddy, I need to go potty and then I have to follow him out there. I love having kids in the service, actually. <laughs> it's the best. Um, so when I read verse 14, I thought about creation and how it perfectly points to God. And that should be our goal, is that everything we do, the words of our mouths, everything that we think, the meditation of our hearts, may that point to God. May our faith be seen and may God be glorified. I was thinking about that so much as I was preparing this because that's kind of the final um, that's kind of the final point that David makes here in the psalm is that just like creation points to God and is just part of his handiwork that points to him, so we have a similar relationship. We are something that he created. We are people that he loves. And our prayer should be that everything that we do, everything that we think, everything that we say, in all of that, our faith would be seen and God would be glorified. And so in that now, we see the fullness of the magnificent sweep of this psalm. You realize that uh, far too often we probably read verses one through six and then we stop there because we're like, yes, God's creation. But now we see the full sweep of this psalm. It brings us from the heavens above to the innermost being of the believer, from the stars above and the mountains that tower over us all the way to our innermost thoughts that only God can seek out as we ponder the importance of his word in our lives. And here's kind of the, the big idea that I came to as I was reading through this. I, you know, I, I, I always, I've read, I read a bunch of articles when I first started preaching by, um, that my, uh, my uncle had written about preaching and, and he always said like, put together a big idea and then, um, and then you know, build your sermon around that. Um, I tried to do that and it was a disaster and I came to this idea after I had gone through all of these verses, verses and studied them deeply. I came to this, this idea right here. If we are ever to praise God and enjoy what he has made in its fullness and correctly, it will be because we learned of who he is by his word. If we're ever to fully enjoy what he has created around us, many, many non-Christians get the idea that um, to, to be a follower of Christ, we have, to, we have to neglect any kind of joy or happiness or fun here on this earth. But the only way for us to fully enjoy what he has made and given us to enjoy is to first understand who he is through his word. And then we can fully enjoy the, the creation that he has put around us. 
because of what we learn from his word, we can actually enjoy the life that he has given us and the purpose that he's put in front of us. Now there's one thing that was hinted at in this passage um, because that God reveals, him way through, reveals himself through a few different ways. There's creation. As we see creation, we can't help but acknowledge a creator. We read his word, and through his word, and, and for, for years, by the way, the Old Testament was, was the scriptures. That, that's, that's what they had. That's all they had. When we read his word, we understand who he is, and we see a revelation of, of, his, of his salvation, of his love, of his truth, of his justice. But then there's one more way he revealed himself, and that was through his son. As much as he reveals himself through creation, as much as he's revealed himself in his word, the fullness of God's revelation was seen in his son, Jesus Christ. Because in Jesus Christ, we saw God's heart for us. And his love for each, each and every one of us and his desire for each of us to come to salvation. Not that everyone's gonna come to salvation, but the book of, of Philippians says that, or, sorry, that's not right. Scratch that. Nori is gonna catch me on this, I know it. <laughs> well, there's the verse in the New Testament that says his hope is that we would all come to salvation. And so when we read this section, it says, then I will be blameless and I shall be acquitted of great transgression. David didn't even know it at the time, but that idea was looking forward to Jesus Christ, even if David didn't realize it. We will be blameless because Jesus carried our sins on his shoulders and will be acquitted of great transgression because he died on the cross for our sins. And so we look back at that and we realize that in all the ways that God reveals himself, whether he um, reveals himself through creation, through his word, through speaking to us through his Holy Spirit, Jesus is God's ultimate revelation of his character. And so then the natural call from there is have you acknowledged that in your heart? And have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Understanding that he came to this earth and he lived a perfect life without sin. Jesus died a death that only we deserve so that we could live the life that only he deserves, that we can be in his presence. And so he sits at the right hand of God now just waiting for us to accept him, just waiting for us to choose that he is our only way to heaven and our only way to salvation. And so before we go back into a few more songs in worship, I'm gonna pray and I'm gonna ask that for those of you that maybe haven't acknowledged him as your Lord and Savior, for those of you that haven't accepted him <clears throat> as the one who sacrificed his life for you, then as we pray, I'm gonna say a simple prayer uh, for you to say along with me. And so my encouragement would be that might not, now would be, I mean, yesterday would have been a better time <laughs> to accept him, but today is, today is good too. And so we're gonna take, take just a little bit of time to pray together and then we're gonna, um, we're gonna sing again in worship. So if you bow, bow your heads with me, if that's you, and if you haven't accepted him as your Lord and Savior and you desire to do that today, then all you have to do is say a simple prayer to acknowledge who he is and what he has done. And it goes like this. Heavenly Father, I know that I have sinned. I know that everything within me desires what is selfish and what is unjust and what is not pure. But you sent your son to die for me when I didn't deserve it after living a life that I could never dream of living in total fulfillment of your word and your law. And so Father, I acknowledge you as king in Jesus Christ, I acknowledge you as my Lord and Savior and desire the rest of my life to follow in your footsteps and look forward to the day where I can spend eternity with you. And so, Father, this morning we give all praise and glory and honor. And our prayer this morning is that as we, as we study your word, as we praise your name, as we sing together, as we fellowship, that our faith would be seen and that in everything you would be glorified. And so we give you praise, we give you glory, and we acknowledge who you are and what you've done. In your holy and precious and matchless name we pray. Amen.